Welcome to Conversations with Educators, where we bring educators from across the country to talk about topics like college and career readiness, graduation tracking, teacher growth, assessment coordination, and more. Let's get started. Okay, I know we've got more that are probably signing on and we want to uh, welcome you today to our conversation with educators. And uh, we're so glad to have you take part and um, know that you're gonna uh, walk away with some great ideas and strategies uh, and learn from our, our guest speaker. So um, I think we're gonna go ahead and and get started. So as I mentioned, this is our um, session conversation with educators. And today we're talking about evaluation strategies with thriving charter schools. And so uh, we're excited to have you as part of that. The way our agenda is gonna work, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Ross. And then we're going to talk about three things today. What are some of the unique challenges of charter schools? Um, how she has gone about building a tailored evaluation system. And then some of her nuggets for keys um, to success. Then we'll open it up for some live Q&A questions. And so um, as you're thinking uh, about what to ask Dr. Ross, we uh, we encourage you to drop that into the, the Q&A chat. So um, Dr. Meredith Ross is the Director of Assessment and Accountability with Charter Schools USA, has a wealth of background, very passionate about students. And uh, Dr. Ross, share a little bit about yourself with us. Sure. Uh, so as Kim said, I am the Director of Assessment and Accountability for Charter Schools USA. We are a uh, charter school management organization. I'm currently in what I'm calling my senior year with CSUSA. So I started uh, the 2012-2013 school year. So the kids that were in kindergarten my first year are now graduating high school class of 2025. I feel a little bit old about that, uh, but we serve about 80,000 students. And right now we have schools, 85 schools across four different states. We're, uh, most of our schools are concentrated in Florida, but we do have a pretty heavy presence in North Carolina and Louisiana with some expansion going on in South Carolina. Awesome. Well, we're so glad that you've taken time today to um, share your expertise. And gosh, with 80,000 plus students and in four states, you have a, uh, a tremendous background in uh, how to navigate the, uh, the evaluation system. So um, let's start off with the first question about what are some of the unique challenges that you face? Sure, and I guess I should mention we have about 5,000 staff that are using evaluation right now. So um, we, we had a homegrown system that we used and it served us pretty well when we were managing a, a single evaluation system. So as we started to expand into more places, the the national trends in the states that we were in were in also we're trying to we're trying we're transitioning to more compliance and accountability, or especially with their pay for performance and staff evaluation. So we needed something a little bit more robust and our homegrown system served us well until it became really cumbersome to make those state specific changes and updates that we needed. Um, so right now, as I mentioned, we're in four different states. We're running three rubrics essentially, but right, we also answer to about 22 authorizers. So in most of our locations, we are not our own school district. And so anytime we're collecting data, whether it be for a staff evaluation or trying to send data out for staff evaluations or pretty much anything really, um, we're doing that sometimes up to 22 different ways because every authorizer has their own template and, and or their own system where things have to be entered. So, um, and actually 20 of those 22 instances, we are not our own school district. So we have even less say <laughs> of yeah. how we are able to process things, submit things and, and gather things. Some 
some are actual PDFs still these days. <laughs> so yeah. not ideal. So we were, we were really looking for a, a partner to help us with our unique data structure mm-hmm. and our unique data situation, which to be honest, many vendors have, have given up in the past and said that they cannot help us. So yeah. Well, it's definitely a lot of coordination and communication with those individual districts. Um, I can't even imagine, you know, just the the uh, the wealth of um, expectations and forms and uh, dialogue. And then you add on to that the state reporting uh, compliance pieces, right? Because multiple states have or evaluations are then submitted onto the state. So definitely some, some challenges. Um, what, so talk to us about how you built your um, tailored system for evaluations. How do you, cause I know you guys do a lot with the goal setting and um, right. those aspects. So, so, so right now we have three sets of rubrics, but that one set of rubrics is currently split into two you know, two different state specific calculations, weighting, ev- everything. The only thing that's the same is the rubric, but that that state is one of those states is actually new changing policy in the state. So we actually mid year are going to have to change and adjust because that state really um, is a little bit late to the game on pushing out what, what they're actually requiring for this school year. So um, by the end of this cycle, we'll have four different sets of rubrics running four different sets of, of calculations. And so um, what what we found in terms of building the system, what we, what we like about uh, evaluation is we needed something that we could customize in the true sense of the word. A lot of times when we would go to vendors, they would tell us that that they could customize, but what they could really do is configure. And so mm-hmm. one of the pieces that was really um, differentiating when we were looking at products was when we were on the phone with the evaluation team and we mentioned something looking at the the demo site or the sandbox, we're like, could, could we maybe do this? And they would say, oh, just refresh your screen and it would be there. And so um, we haven't really found much of anything that uh, we've thrown their way where you know, you guys haven't been able to accommodate very, very few things. And we have uh, had some workarounds, but those are, are functioning. So um, we, use, we typically are the squeaky wheel and the <laughs> you guys have been able to, 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 to work through that with us. Um, we have some of the most complicated scoring that I've seen. We have um, lots of pieces to our evaluation, the, the complete system that are uh, scored each in their own different way. Sometimes it varies by state. So uh, it's just been super helpful to have a partner who can understand that you know we're working to meet the requirements of a lot of different authorizers and uh, compliance pieces. So we appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely. Yeah. And it really is challenging, you know, when states have new legislative um, initiatives and new laws and different ways that they want um, calculations made and the reporting uh, that definitely is a, is a, um, challenge to get in place and to keep on top of, right? Um, So what are some of your keys to success? How do you work with your individual um, authorizers, the districts that you're in? What are some of the things that you found to be very successful in that coordination and communication? So as charters, we're a little unique in that we do have some flexibility with the state systems, but there are some like basic non-negotiables that that we have to be. So we always start there when we're when we're looking at, you know, when we were looking at the, a new system in general, but now with this new uh, valuation system in one of our states, we kind of start with the basics of what we absolutely have to have and then figure out what makes sense for our network, our philosophy, our approach to coaching and feedback. Um, So generally what we try to do as much as possible is involve our key stakeholders 
from the very beginning. So uh, I don't know if you were on any of our demos, Kim, but we had uh, an open call for principals to join us. We had a, a committee where we were not only using them to vet the system that they liked the best, but also to push the vendor on what features and you know what would be helpful. So having the people that are going to be doing the day-to-day -day involved every step of the way is a critical piece that we do. Um, and then we had that team that was doing those demos with us and getting involved in, you know, what our requirements would be, what our wish, you know, if we could have anything in the world lists, those, right. those also became our champions. So we were pretty strategic in the leaders that were part of that group. So they were the, they were the leaders that were leaders in our net, not only leaders of their building, but leaders in their network. So they became the champions of the product, or even if you already have the product selected, it's the champion to roll out whatever change you're doing. So hearing it from other leaders, other people that are in the same position as them tends to go a lot farther. We got we we get more buy-in when it's their peers rolling it out compared to me, you know, in my desk at our district office trying to do it. So that was right. key. And then as much as possible, we try to do gradual rollouts. So we understand that, especially as charters, you know, yes, you're the school principal, but a lot of times you're also the business manager. You're also the community liaison. You wear a lot of hats when you're in that position at a charter school. You don't have sort of that, that district back office as, mm -hmm. as, you know, as much as a traditional public school. So our leaders are, you know, wear a lot of hats and are really busy. So what we try to do is do that gradual rollout so that we prioritize getting them what they need to know when they need to know it. So at the beginning of the year, we didn't train them on the finalization process. We trained them on how to get in the system, how to do a like a, a quick walkthrough, how to create that baseline and how to get their teachers in to do their self-evaluations, which all of those things should be happening uh, at the front end. And then with that, we also paired it with the um, training on our new rubric, which by the way, the same time we were rolling out a new system, we were also rolling out a new rubric, which they were even more excited about because we went from like 70 indicators down to 30. So um, we, yeah. we kind of paired the logistics of the system with the, the why behind the what what for the professional development on their their new rubric. So um, gradual rollouts, getting the key stakeholders involved, uh, and then using those key stakeholders all throughout the process in terms of training. Uh, the other piece that we found really helpful was because we have so many different outside systems that are specific to each of our authorizers, we created a lot of our own process documents that leaders can access so that yes, they have the, the screenshots in the tasks within SF, with sorry, within evaluation, we still call it SFS, um, yeah. <laughs> within evaluation, but they also can see side by side some of our internal systems so that they can better understand how it fits in our ecosystem. So that really helps bridge the gap between evaluation, our internal systems, and then all of the systems that I don't even have access to from our authorizers. Right. Um, yeah. And we're in year three. Uh, we're still tweaking the, you know, we're still making minor tweaks to the, the systems that are consistent, but we are mm -hmm. also adjusting sort of midstream for that new state accountability or state uh, evaluation system, which being in this world for 13 years, there's always something, at least one of our states is changing something every year. So having right. a partner that can help us navigate that and makes that, I don't want to say painless, but pretty seamless um, is great. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like you are very intentional with your um, forming the design team, getting those key stakeholders, uh, not only for the buy-in, but also for the process as well, so that they can become supporters. And um, that's that's fantastic. Um, and they, I do see one. 
question that... they do they do the work so they're the ones that are telling me like that's that's not going to work you know you know they're the experts in what they have to do day to day so it's it's almost a requirement on our end to make sure that we understand and get their perspective and their yeah. opinion being responsive to the boots on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. The ones that are actually yeah. <laughs> implementing it. <laughs> um, so I do see one question that's come in. Uh, how do you work when you're going into a district or an authorizer? How do you work to set up and marry the two, the two systems? So it depends on what the role of evaluation is going to play in that state. So in two of our four states up until this year, we could run our own evaluation system as long as we're meeting basic state statutes, which we have access to that. Um, and then we just submit the results at the end of the year. In our Florida schools, it's manual entry. Someone's sitting there keying in six or seven fields per teacher per year. In the other state, they could upload a spreadsheet Two of the other states, they have a formal evaluation platform that those schools have to use for their final summative evaluations. But what those mm -hmm. platforms lack is the ability for leaders to do those informal walkthroughs and uh, document, upload resources, that kind of thing for those day to day, because you know our our philosophy. Someone should be in that classroom, whether it's the principal, the assistant principal, the curriculum coach, whoever it is. Someone should be in our classrooms at least once every other week, at a minimum. And so, being able to capture that and monitor that, and give teachers valuable feedback so that they can improve their practice. So. In those states, we use the system more as that formative to capture the formative mm -hmm. data and we we structure what would traditionally be that end year finalization to be in a format that's helpful for them when they go to sit down and do that formal evaluation in their state system. So we structure those finalizations so that it's really easy for them to sit down for that formal classroom observation and have visibility to all of the things that that teacher is working on. So, yeah. um, and that, that the, the, the third state, or sorry, the state that is that we do have, one of the states is transitioning from being fully in our system to that, you know, officially have a state model. So that's the state that we're working through right now, but Unfortunately, that state doesn't um, really know what we have. We're not in the state system yet. They haven't released it to schools yet. Right. A month and <laughs> so, a half into school. So yeah, <laughs> still in the waiting game. Yes. It, education by legislation. <laughs> but as charters, we are in a unique position that, you know, we do have to, in most states, we do have to meet some basic state guidelines and state statutes. And then we figure out where we can innovate and tailor it to our specific philosophy and approach to feedback for That's teachers. Great. And I know you do a lot of um, data gathering too, as well, as far as not only the evaluations, but the walkthroughs and um, how do you utilize some of that data that you find within the system to guide your planning? And generally, CSUSA is a very data driven environment so not not just from the ground up our kids are used to tracking their own data i would say our leaders and our ex executives are very data savvy so um we do we have a, a pretty robust continuous improvement cycle so quarterly we get together with our state superintendents and our executive team to review various different priorities Talent development is one of those. So we look at that at least quarterly at the executive level where we're, we're keeping track, not just of how staff are doing. So the, you know, the competencies that they've, you know, mastered, things like that, but also um, for principal supervisors and that executive level, we're looking at, are they completing what they need to in terms of observations, both formative and summative to make sure that 
you know, we're holding up our end of the bargain when we tell staff that we have a, you know, a coaching and feedback cycle where we're going to give you feedback regularly and we, to help you get to get better. So a lot of what we do above the school level is making sure we're getting those necessary and quality feedback in. And then at the school level, they're using things like the heat map report to really assess which areas as a school they need maybe to, to get some professional development on. Or when we're talking about PLCs, they can use that heat map report to look at groups of teachers that have similar opportunities for growth um, and maybe put them in a PLC together or pair some of those staff with people who are really strong in that area. Okay. Yeah. Lots, lots of lots of ways that we use data. Uh, but yeah, those are those are the two main ways. <laughs> yeah. And there's so because it's so rich in the the data that you take out, you can plan, you know, your professional development and like you said, your PLCs and teachers can use it individually uh for their own growth and progress. Um and the feedback tool, I think, is has been very uh, beneficial for for um, for teachers. So, anything else that you um, would like to share? I don't see any other questions. Uh, I, I mean, I think that's it. The only other thing I would mention is um, for some of our from some of our states, when you only have that summative feedback at the end of the year, we were we were finding that. Um, teachers that were coming to us from outside of our network that, you know, I don't, you know, usually that's done at the end of the year in a crazy shuffle. And so they don't mm -hmm. always understand how they're being evaluated. And so we really appreciate the ability to do those formative assessments because we realized some of those teachers had never received feedback aligned to how they're going to be evaluated at the end of the yeah. year. And so they getting them used to not just ha having someone in your classroom to help you get better and not as a punitive uh, piece was an adjustment, uh, but also making sure that we're doing right by them and giving them feedback on the things that they're going to be held accountable to at the end of the year. Yeah, that's so critical in a growth with a growth mindset. Absolutely. If you, you know, you don't want that summative to be the. That shouldn't um, be the first time. That's right. That you hear that, you know, you need to work on something. Yeah, yeah. Creating that coaching coaching cycle, and I think with your your strategy of getting the the administrators in and your instructional coaches and getting everybody familiar with the system um, allows them to get in and and do that. And then plus, you can, like you said, you guys monitor that too to ensure accountability that teachers are getting what they need. So anyway, well, thank you so much for sharing, sharing okay. those ideas, Dr. Ross. Um, as Dr. Ross mentioned, evaluation does make things easier. We, uh, we do customize and uh, make sure that we're taking care of all of our, our clients. Um, here's a screenshot of one of the, the heat maps, as Dr. Ross mentioned, but um, to monitor what's happening with teachers and uh, facilitating their growth in a single portal. So everything's all there together to develop that um, action action plan. So um, we wanna thank you for this time and uh, hope that you found the ideas and strategies beneficial and please reach out uh, to us here at Education Advanced. And um, our goal is always to make things easier so you can devote time with, with students. So we want to uh, thank you and I hope you have a great, great day. Thank you, Dr. Ross, for sharing. Thanks for joining us. If you want to learn more about college and career readiness, graduation tracking, teacher growth, assessment coordination, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter. Until next time.